Welcome to Life Devotions, and thank you for joining me today. We ought to love one another. It's the title of this devotion right here in 1 John chapter 4, verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The Bible shows us very clearly that you cannot say you know God whom you cannot see and say you know him and then not love the people whom you can see when God is love. If you know God, then you will express his nature, his character, his person, and God is love. And God said, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he sent his son, who is the propitiation for our sins. If God so loved us by making Christ a substitute, how can we not express that love for others? And that beckons and calls for the question, where do you get your ability to love? How are you able to love? To what degree are you able to express that love? To what point do you fail to show that love? Where do you fall short? And that you get so angry and so offended and so enraged and so mad and so angry that you lose control. And, and you can justify that by, by exposing the failing of another. But what you will do by going down that road is drive yourself further and further away from God himself. You see, Jesus Christ never failed to demonstrate that he is God in his humility. And he took that humility of submission and surrender to the Father to the extreme of death on the cross, dear friends. We read this in Philippians 2, starting at verse 5. And you see, Jesus demonstrated that he is God, that in all that he is, says and does, he makes God visible in that he humbled himself. And in his humility and in becoming poor in suffering or failing, he did not fail to show forth the love of God. And the reason I bring this up is to say that what you see in Jesus is what he longs to reveal in you. I've read it to you and I will keep reading it. You'll hear this from me probably all the time because this is where I kind of live. It's my feeding ground. Jesus said, he who feeds on me will live because of me in John 6, 57. But he says, as the Father loved me. You see, this is the secret, dear friends. The secret is you live in this unfailing love, inexhaustible resource of love in the fountain that never runs dry. And that is the Father's love from everlasting to everlasting His love. His love is greater than the universe. That's incomprehensible for our puny minds. That's like somebody saying to a fish, God's love is bigger than the oceans in which you swim. How can a fish ever comprehend the Pacific and the Atlantic and the Black Sea and the Red Sea and the Dead Sea and the North Sea and, and on and on, the waters of the earth? I mean, who can comprehend the greatness, the depth of it, the width, the length of it? Who could say in, in gallons or liters, I can tell you how much water there is in the earth? I mean, folks, we, we, we can't comprehend it. The fountains of the deep, aren't discovered in all of their amazing reservoirs that are hidden away under the earth. And yet, yet, God's love is greater. So can a fish describe the greatness of the waters in which it swim? Could a bird describe the greatness of the heavens in which it flies? Can we comprehend the height, the depth, and the breadth, and length of the love of the Father? that has been made manifest through Jesus. Oh, my dear friends, there's more of it than you could ever comprehend. And I want to encourage you. That love was perfectly displayed in all that Jesus is, says and does. And that love was perfect in all of his suffering. It did not fail to show you. Come on, as the Father has loved you, you can love. You can, and this is the secret, friends. 
as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. We see the love of Jesus Christ. I love this, you know, I look up these scriptures and they so inspire me. John 13, verse 1, Jesus longing to show his disciples the greatness of the love with which he loved them, demonstrated that love for them in that he took on the servant's garb of a linen cloth and began to wash their feet. You may think, yeah, Pastor, I so long for more of that power, that anointing, that grace. But folks, you got to use what you've got if you want to see it increase. You got to take the love you have, even if it's but a drop, and quench the thirst of the next person and it will increase. That is the law of God. And Jesus began to wash his disciples' feet and he changed the whole atmosphere of strife that was in this room of who's the greatest. There was so much, so much power struggle in that room of who was the greatest and Jesus completely disarmed that power struggle and what stirred up that power struggle is, I'm not washing your feet, I'm not, I'm not your slave. I'm not smarter than you. I am closer to Jesus when he took me on the Mount of Transfiguration, not you. And that, that spirit, that spirit is so ugly. It's so self-seeking. It creates such bad atmosphere in the house. I'm not getting up and doing the dishes. I did it last time. And I'm not the slave here in this house. You never do anything. I always have to, that is all ugly, ugly, ugly. But how often does that happen? And Jesus wanted to demonstrate that great love of the Father and he began to sweetly serve by washing their feet. And he said, now if you know what I have done, blessed are you if you do it. And Jesus demonstrated the Father's love simply by laying down his life to serve those around him. If you want to begin to live in this great reservoir of love, you've got to start practicing it right where you are, at home, in your workplace, but especially in your home, in your workplace, on the streets, and anywhere and everywhere where you are. And this is what I want to talk to you about for a second here, because so often we feel the gnawing of unfulfillment inside of us because we don't practice, what, we don't use what we got. The Apostle Paul writes to one of the churches and he says, you, in, in, in Philemon I think, he says, you have become effective in communicating the faith of Christ by knowing what you have received in Him. They begin to know it by practicing it. Folks, if you don't practice love, you don't know you got it. You gotta practice it. You gotta just get up and do it. And they will come, you mean, Pastor, if I get up and do the dishes at home, if I go ahead and clean up every, uh, after everybody else, I can experience this love of God without question especially when you do it without complaining, as Philippians 2 talks about. Do all things as unto the Lord without complaining. And you do it with that sweetness that comes from your love in Him and your love for Him. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 31, that the world may know that I love the Father. As the Father gave me commandments, so I do. Arise and let us go from here. And he's talking about the cross. The Father gave him the commandment to give his life on the cross. And he says, so that the whole world may know I love the Father. Folks, you can say you love God, but if you don't show it by what you do for another, then that love is not real. It's just a thought, but it's not a life. Jesus demonstrated his love for the Father by giving his life for you and me. And if the Father loved us so much by giving Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins, ought we not to also love one another? That's the title. Love one another. And Jesus here says, as the Father loved me, I love you. Abide in my love. This is the key. You've got to abide in his love. And then he, Peter, puts this in the language that I think we need today desperately in the world in which we live, in which there's so much hostility. He says in verse 18 of chapter 2 of 1 Peter, 
servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. In other words, when you're in the workplace and the people instruct you what to do, and maybe they're unmannerly or they're crude, they're rude, they're harsh, they're domineering, they're not easy to work for, you do it with a sweet, willing spirit, right? Servants, be submissive to your own masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. Wow, is that in the Bible? Yes, that's verse 18 of 1 Peter chapter 2. For this is commendable if because of conscience towards God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, listen to this, verse 21, because Christ, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. You see, Jesus, having laid down his life for us, opened the new life, giving way to the Father, and calls us to follow him, to lay down our life, to be crucified with him on behalf of one another. Ought we not to love one another? Amen. Now he committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Again, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whom stripes we are healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Right? Got this? Now look at this. Wives. Likewise, be submissive to your own husband, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wife. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied with fear, do not let your dormant be merely outward. Yes, be pretty on the outside, but don't let, be, don't let the, that be your only beauty, no. He said, arranging your hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. But rather, he's not saying don't do it. He said, but don't let that be the only beauty you have. He says, rather let it be the hidden person of your heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle, quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Mm. For in this manner, in former times, holy women who trusted God also adorned themselves being submissive to their own husband as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands, likewise. Don't you think that the wife has to have a submissive spirit and you a domineering spirit? Never, never in Jesus' name. Jesus was never domineering. He was always gentle and kind. No, husbands, likewise, dwell with them, with your wife, with understanding. Understanding is not mental, it's not just mental. It is having you that fatherly loving heart to be one with your wife, not only try to fix it or try to tell her what she should or shouldn't do, but be one with her and that she feels you're one with her. And that is a great revelation husbands need giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered finally all of you be of one mind having compassion for one another love as brothers be tender-hearted be courteous not returning evil for evil or reviling for revival but on the contrary blessing knowing you were called to this that you may inherit a blessing. Now listen, he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lip from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But his face are towards is against those who do evil. 
And he who is, uh, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And I believe that no matter what, God would so empower you to be able to love one another. I believe God would so empower you. Can I give you one more scripture in closing? It's something that, that I meditate on and it helps me keep my spirit right, especially when I suffer. And it's right here in Colossians 3, verse 12 and 13. Listen to this. Clothe yourself, therefore, as God's own chosen ones, his own picked representatives who are purified, holy, and well-beloved by God himself by putting on behavior marked by tender-hearted pity, mercy, kind feeling, lowly opinion of yourself, gentle ways, and patience, which is tireless and long-suffering, that has the power to endure whatever comes with good temper, good attitude, be gentle, forbearing with one another. And if one has a difference or a grievance or a complaint against another, readily pardon each other. Even as the Lord has freely forgiven you, so you must also forgive. God would have you in a place to represent him in your love for one another and that there comes a joy in your heart that you realize what Jesus said that we read about in Acts 20, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. Have a good day.